Hi everyone, I'm Evelyn Kent, a content strategist at SmartLogic. I'm filling in for Richard Pinder today. At SmartLogic, I create content strategy and messaging around our software. I came to SmartLogic from McClatchy Tribune, where I built a multifaceted ontology that classified 2 million news stories a year. At MCT, we use the SmartLogic platform SIM4, so I have a user's perspective on the software and what it can help you do. Today I'm hosting Ralph Poole, who has 35 years of experience in knowledge management. Ralph will be talking about strategies he has used to make KM solutions work better. And for those of you just starting your KM projects, you'll hear how to help plan for a progressively better solution. Those of you who have started building your solutions, Ralph will give you some information that will help them perform better. And with that, let's say hello to Ralph. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Evelyn, for the introduction. As Evelyn mentioned, I've worked in knowledge management for my entire career, primarily in prof professional services. I started my career at the Boston Consulting Group, moved to Bain & Company, then Ernst & Young and Capgemini, where I was the chief knowledge officer and responsible for knowledge management, learning, and business research. In addition to my uh, work in professional service firms, I've worked as a knowledge manager and a knowledge consultant in the oil and gas industry, media, retail, apparel, in the legal industry, and also pharmaceuticals. And the example that I'm going to give you today is from um, some of my work in the pharmaceutical industry. The agenda for the discussion is first to discuss some background on semantics in which I'll define terms. I'll give you an example from my experience on semantic enrichment, and I'll conclude with some recommendations that you can take forward and apply in your business. So, Ellen, if you want to move forward the slide. One of the best quotes about the value of knowledge management came from one of my clients, LEK Consulting. Um, I've done a lot of work in business strategy consulting firms. L LEK is also a business strategy consulting firm with about 2,000 people and offices all over the world. They're headquartered in London. Um, a partner there said, knowledge management allows us to be confident that we always sell and deliver engagements using our best and most relevant analytic techniques, business knowledge, and insight. It's this confidence and the ability to precisely find uh, the right content that makes knowledge management value valuable and convinced LEK of the value proposition for making an investment in growing their knowledge management capabilities. You can go forward. So we developed a, a process map that would describe um, how they captured knowledge and that gave them the confidence that they could find and reuse their best business insight. We call this a knowledge process landscape. First, we acquire practice experience from artifacts produced in the course of client works like proposals, presentations, work plans, and deliverables. We also acquired external content from the business press to inform consultants about the competitive environment, um, market size, and relative cost position. Uh, the middle box is called add value. Um, adding value in this case means applying metadata, adding metadata, adding taxonomy to describe what the content is about. Um, you can also add value to content by filtering or curating the content, and typically Communities of practice will do that. Subject matter experts can decide on what's most important and recommend um, how to use the content to solve client problems. Um, in addition to adding value by curating, we also add value by making something different, by synthesizing our practice experience into a format that can be reused. So for example, in this case, you might make job aids, checklists, training presentations, methodologies, and analytical toolkits. Finally, all of this content is provisioned to a search engine and presented in context for users. So you might present it in a website where they could click through and browse uh, content so they can rapidly apply it to their business problems. Then we learn from that experience and acquire their practice experience after they've applied it in their, their client uh, engagement. So um, this is a virtuous circle. You can uh, go ahead. Um, why add value to content? Uh, first of all, 
it makes it findable by increasing, increasing search precision. You use metadata actually to boost the relevancy of terms, so the search engine will always find the best content and present it at the top of the search results list. You add value um, to make content more meaningful by relating terms and concepts and um, applying consistent names, defining terms, exposing terms as facets, and exposing terms in the result set. You add value by putting content in context by applying descriptive metadata. So you can identify the source of the data, you can assess its provenance, uh, whether you can trust the data or not, um, who participated on the team, for example, and what were the primary objectives of the project. You can encourage exploration and learning, um, and, and typically the uh, people will problem solve during the, the, the search process and learn as they search a topic and integrate towards an answer. If you extract facts from um, unstructured data, you can ask uh, different kinds of questions of the data um, and transfer unstructured data to structured tables that can be analyzed in more uh, traditional ways. Um, in fact, you can even visualize the results. Um, another way of adding value is to stop users from solving the same problems over and over again by surfacing analogous problem solving experience. You can go forward. How do you actually uh, make content more meaningful? How do you add semantic value to content? Well, from the previous examples, you can tell that you add metadata to enrich the content. Um, you add metadata to describe relationships among terms and concepts, and you model the way that people think about a domain. Uh, semantic enhancement means that you add meaning to the terms and concepts defining um, uh, the terms and uh, explaining relationships, and you can expose these relationships to, to users. Meaning is encapsulated in a semantic model, and I'm going to describe three semantic models today, uh, a taxonomy, a thesaurus, and an ontology. The next slide is a picture of the spe uh, a spectrum of uh, semantic relationships or knowledge re representation. And there are three semantic models that are arrayed here from weak, se weak semantics to very strong semantic relationships being exposed in the, in the model. Um, a taxonomy provides consistent semantics for describing a hierarchy of terms that have broader, broader or narrower meaning. Concepts are described as subclasses of terms in the hierarchy. It's in this way you can describe what content's about. A thesaurus describes four semantic relationships, equivalents or synonyms of the terms, homographic relationships, so that's terms that are spelled the same but mean something different. And um, it also, in a thesaurus, you'll see hierarchical relationships amongst the terms, just like you would in a, uh, a taxonomy. And um, you also will see associative terms. That's related terms, terms that are related to the, um, to the subject. An ontology describes a much richer semantic relationship. So you, in an ontology, you define terms, you can relate terms, define concepts, relate concepts. It's a very structured and logical model. Most knowledge bases that we would use uh, use taxonomy to, to tag uh, content. Um, but there's uh, much more value that you can add to that content um, by increasingly defining the variables. You can go on to the next, uh, next slide. An ontology defines terms used to describe and represent an area of knowledge. It's a formal description of general knowledge in a domain, and it's expressed in a user in a, in a machine readable format. Ontologies are built with the help of people. Typically, you'd involve subject matter experts in a domain of knowledge and allow those experts to help you decide on the small number of precise definitions and terms that describe the domain. It's this structured model with explicitly defined terms that allows computers, databases, and people to share information and to ensure that they're talking about the same thing. You can go on to the, to the next slide. Um, this is a simple model 
um, a simple model of an ontology, a group of network relationships among terms. It begins to define and show meaningful relationships. So for example, if you look at the top line, a, diagno a diagnosis is derived from symptoms. If you look in the middle of the page, you'll see the word disease. A disease causes symptoms. And then to the right of disease, you'll see therapy. A therapy applies to disease. And at the top of the page, um, you'll see that pain is a symptom. If you go on to the next slide, um, these kinds of relationships uh, are, are much more valuable to people that are are using an ontology. But you'll see that uh, there are some taxonomic relationships actually described in this ontology. Um, I've circled uh, uh, several. Pain is a, is a type of symptom. Genetic testing is a type of diagnosis. Physiotherapy is a type of therapy. These semantic relationships add meaning to the data that's being described so you can tell what the content is about. And um, uh, one note here that is a, um, when I say pain is a symptom, is a symptom, that term is a, um, describes a taxonomic relationship. You might also say a type of or a kind of. So pain is a kind of system. So those, uh, those type of relationships tip you off to the fact that it's a, a, uh, a taxonomy. The semantic value is a taxonomy. Um, if you go on to the next slide, now I'm going to describe actually an example from my experience in the biotechnology industry. We uh, developed a product knowledge base. Um, I'll use this example to illustrate how to enhance content semantically. The chevrons at the top of the page show the drug development life cycle from drug discovery to development to submission to health authorities and later commercialization. Uh, typically, discovery to commercialization can take up to 15 years. And since this is a highly regulated industry, the entire process is extremely well documented. This is the entire life cycle is a highly document centric process. The graph shows the accumulation of experience and documents over time. When you add product maintenance and product line extensions, you can imagine that the useful life of documents um, can be up to 30 years. So um, that's very unusual and different than other, other industries. In this case, there's a very well-defined set of users and use cases. Uh, we know how people will use the data under what circumstances, so we can describe it, so we must describe it in enough detail that users can successfully search and apply data to, uh, the relevant data to solve their problem. In, in this case, the primary users are scientists, quality assurance people, document management specialists, uh, senior management, uh, people involved in tech support, regulatory people, operations, and people involved in QC labs. Um, the major uses of product knowledge are in submission support to the health authorities, uh, in inspection. Sometimes the health authorities will actually come into a plant and uh, uh, visit a plant and inspect the manufacturing processes uh, to see whether they're in, in uh, operating in scope. And, um, and you can also use this for sharing troubleshooting information, risk management, and sharing lessons learned. So you can page forward to the next slide. So let's examine how you create a semantically rich knowledge base. Typically, companies start with lots of uncoordinated, disparate repositories of content that are widely dispersed through the entire organization. Uh, each of the repositories will have different security models and no common metadata. Uh, which makes it very difficult to work. And there's lots of uh, usually political kinds of uh, problems that you need to solve in order to get access to data and to um, uh, make all of this uh, data 
available. You can also see that there's um, a number of different technologies that are used, Documentum, SharePoint, uh, FileNet, there, uh, there's data that's in proprietary quality management uh, applications, there's uh, portfolios of projects, and then lots of data that uh, actually um, appears in local drives. Um, the next steps, if you want to create an access to a database and unlock the value to the content, is to make an inventory of all the product-related content and uh, information. Then, to create the metadata, you can text mine the content to extract terms and concepts that are used in documents. Once you've built the taxonomy uh, that describes the, the content, uh, you can enrich it with related terms, synonyms, and homonyms. So um, that previous slide that I showed you, which shows the hierarchy of, uh, of uh, semantic models, um, it, you can apply here. You can add, actually add value to, to the taxonomy and make, it, uh, make the terms that you're using more relevant to users. All of these value-adding steps are working towards a future state in which you overlay a search engine, federate search so you can get results from all the various different content stores, synchronized metadata, rationalized repositories so that uh, it's in fewer repositories um, and uh, is more easily, easily navigated, and build uh, an ontology to strengthen the relationships between uh, terms and concepts and make uh, the content more useful to users. So you can page forward. Um, this is a picture of the text, SmartLogix text mining application. And um, this is how you actually mine documents for uh, content and terms that might be appropriate to describe the content. Uh, so you see here, I've just taken, uh, uh, I've analyzed um, down at the bottom, you'll see 163 documents. There were 55,000 phrases that were filtered, and the software is presenting 3,500 uh, of those phrases in, in this context. So we're, we're looking here at the term validation. Um, now, some of the terms that uh, are exposed um, don't make a lot of sense. So you certainly would not use that. So you wouldn't use validation of as a, as a term to describe content. But you'd certainly use method validation as a descriptive term um, to describe the content of a, of a document. In this case, in this, uh, these 163 documents, uh, there were 74 documents that contained that noun phrase. That's 45% of the entire corpus, and uh, there, it was uh, used 282 times. There were 282 instances of this noun phrase uh, used in the, in the corpus. It's a good indication that it's valuable and, uh, and uh, would be descriptive of the content. Another one uh, that I've highlighted at the bottom is uh, uh, validation planning. That's another descriptive term with lots of semantic value. Um, there were 31 documents where validation uh, appeared. That's 19% of the entire corpus. And it appeared uh, uh, there were 105 instances of that noun phrase being used uh, in the corpus. So this is a good indication of some of the variables that you can use. You can go on. It's fine. Um, this is uh, the tool from SmartLogic that uh, I used um, called Ontology Manager to actually build the relationships and to uh, uh, arrange them in a, in a hierarchy. Um, so you'll see here uh, the term critical quality attributes. Uh, this is a, a, a term that, that's really relevant. Quality attributes are really relevant to people who are practicing in this industry. And I've highlighted particulate analysis to actually give you an example of the, the definition of particulate analysis that's um, on the right-hand side of this, uh, of, of this chart. So it gives a very detailed definition. This uh, um, application uh, allows you to add uh, lots of semantic detail to the terms that appear in, in the ontology. Down at the bottom of the, the, the slide, you'll see that we can also add relationships. We can add, expose a family of terms. Um, we can add term attributes and, and properties to make uh, um, this term 
really expressive and um, add a lot of value to, the, uh, to um, people who are searching for content. Um, as always, you, you need to confirm your understanding of the domain via interviews with subject matter experts. So using text mining, arraying uh, content or metadata in this way uh, really needs to be checked with subject matter experts. They're the, they're the people that are doing the work. They're the users that are going to use the systems, and, um, and you really need to check with them to make sure these, uh, these terms make sense and the relationships make sense. You can go on to the next slide. So text mining identifies concepts that enrich the meaning of data. And I've uh, selected uh, about seven or eight of the terms that are particularly rich semantically. Uh, we already talked about crit critical quality attributes. Um, an example, the example of this is I, I mentioned particulate analysis. There's also uh, the attribute called appearance, container closure integrity, potency. These are all terms that are defined and highlighted under critical quality attributes. Uh, product names are important, and the scientific name that is a synonym of the product name um, needs to be displayed. Also, there may be preferred terms in the business that they use for a product name. And there are related terms and synonyms frequently that are descriptive of the product that, um, that people need to know. Uh, so all of this adds semantic value to, to the terms. Other terms might be protocols, standard operating procedures, quality requirements, study types, and test names. On the right-hand side of this slide, you'll see um, questions uh, that you can ask of the data. And typically, questions in this type of system can be more sophisticated than using um, Boolean logic in other, uh, in other types of search experiences. Um, for example, a question that you might be able to ask is what properties of the drug contribute to the drug's opacity? Now, appearance actually talks about the opacity, so you'd be able to understand much more detail about that particular attribute if you were to ask this question. Another question that you might be able to ask um, is about materials of construction. Uh, a vendor changed the composition of a component used to filter a drug substance in a critical phase of the drug production. Have we had problems with this vendor? Or, uh, or have we had problems with the material that's used as a fit, uh, the filtrate? Um, this is a very important question, and, um, and you'd be able to uh, find the answers to this, find the vendors, uh, find the materials, understand what the effect might be on the drug substance. If there are, you want the, the drug to be as pure as possible, certainly, and, um, and you want to know what, what uh, materials are coming in contact with the drug substance. Uh, finally, uh, uh, the last question that I wanted to highlight uh, is uh, a reagent is spilled on the manufacturing floor. What's the best way to clean it up? Um, in this case, you might use standard operating procedures to, uh, to, to find the answer to that kind of question. So all of these questions are tough questions uh, that perhaps would be more difficult to answer if you had uh, uh, less expressive um, terms describing the content. So odontology is very important to answer these kinds of questions. You can go on. So we've been describing um, what I call a content enrichment workflow. And this is a very simple model of what that might look like uh, uh, technically. Um, you ingest unstructured content. You describe it uh, using industry-specific models. And SmartLogic presides those, those tools. Uh, you can extract uh, facts from the knowledge base using a knowledge extraction engine. And again, SmartLogic uh, provides those tools. Uh, then, as I mentioned, you federate the knowledge base and, uh, and present it to uh, the search application. Uh, now, we haven't talked a lot about uh, the search or the user workflow, um, but that can has uh, but you use semantics also um, to understand queries, and that may be a topic for an, another uh, webinar. Uh, but users make queries; uh, they're parsed semantically, so we can understand uh, the terms and what they're they're looking for. Again, Smart Logic uh, has those kinds of tools. You create a, a structured set of queries uh, to uh, investigate the databases, and you'll return with a, uh, a, a result set that is meaningful to, to users. 
you can go on. So um, what are the takeaways from this, uh, this conversation? Um, first of all, adding semantic metadata makes content more meaningful to users, and, uh, and that has to have value. So uh, making content by describing it well is the objective of what we want to do to enable users to find, and, uh, find the right content. You can use tools like text mining to find meaningful terms and concepts within the documents. So we're looking for important entities, noun phrases, terms, and exposing them to users. And there are different degrees of value that you can add by describing semantic relationships. And we showed that on um, that's the, the slide where I showed the spectrum of uh, knowledge representation. Uh, and then you can incrementally increase the value of the of, say, a taxonomy uh, by relating terms and adding concepts and defining terms and defining concepts. So you can, over time, add lots of value to the taxonomy and make it more semantically rich. Uh, you do this because adding semantics makes content easier to find, understand, and apply. Uh, so at this point, I wanted to hand it back to Evelyn, um, and she'll talk a little bit more, and then we'll uh, we will have an opportunity to answer some of your questions. Uh, thanks, Ralph, for that really informative presentation. Before we take questions from the audience, I'll take uh, just about three minutes here to talk about Semaphore, which can help people create just the sort of metadata you've been talking about. So Semaphore supports the creation of taxonomies, thesauri, ontologies, and other controlled vocabularies. And in Semaphore, you can define the relationships that add the context that Ralph has been talking about. And you can do this as an iterative process, as he also suggested in takeaways. That's to say, you can use what you already have in place, and you can build on it. Semaphore is fairly intuitive and easy to use so that the people who know the content best can help build the ontology. And it also allows for systems of checks and approvals so that the ontology experts can control what is approved and when, while still allowing subject matter experts to help build it. And then once you've built the ontology, Semaphore um, uses it to auto-classify content and apply metadata to unstructured text. We can output that metadata as triples, XML, RDFA, plain old text, and even more. And as Ralph talked about, you can use this rich metadata layer to, um, for, for precise information retrieval, to suggest related content, to harmonize data that is stored in disparate formats and across multiple silos, and for queries that combine structured data and unstructured data to get genuine insights into what's happening inside of your organization. And in fact, we have um, done this for many really good organizations. We've done this and other projects for them. They do really to, they can do really interesting things with that unstructured information that's been sitting there and not really being put to use. It's probably worth noting that Semaphore works with many existing systems, including content management systems, search engines. SharePoint, records management systems, workflow systems, and more. We have pre-built integrations with SharePoint, the Google Search Appliance, Solar, Sitecore, Oracle. We work really well with MarkLogic and other data stores. So where we can really help you throughout the process of looking at your data, unstructured data, figuring out what to do with it, how to access it, look at it, analyze it, and come up with answers to questions that make for your business, which really does make your content more valuable. And I think with that, we're out of time and I'll field a few questions. But I should note that if we don't get to your questions today, we'll send you follow -up, a follow-up email with answers. So, let's see what we do have here. Ralph, someone asks when and why you might decide to use a taxonomy instead of a thesaurus or an ontology. Um. That's actually a really good question. Um, I think uh, you really need to, when you're making a decision about how, uh, how to represent uh, semantics, um, you need to understand user requirements. So first, uh, you need to calibrate how to categorize the content based on usage scenarios that users, real users, describe. Answers, these kinds of answers will, uh, uh, 
combine controlled vocabularies, taxonomies, or other semantic models. Uh, you can look at metadata that describes how content is, uh, is managed now. Uh, I think um, it's very likely that you'll find controlled vocabularies that describe content and document types, locations, geographic regions. Uh, um, I found department lists of controlled vocabularies of department names and, and date conventions. So um, you can find a lot of the metadata that you might use in, um, in, in content uh, that you'll find in various repositories. Um, you know, I find it easier to edit rather than to create. So I start typically with a set of candidate terms uh, that result from text mining, and then um, interview subject matter experts uh, to understand how these terms are used, how they make sense, and how to group the content. So you can uh, begin to see how the relationships between um, uh, the terms and they'll help you define whether it's uh, whether you need to use a taxonomy a thesaurus or or really be an expressive model uh, you can look at documents that actually describe hierarchies of terms and so um, in in my example I use the uh, the term uh, critical quality app attributes. Now I, find that I found a number of critical quality attributes. Um, and um, I found a document actually in the business that uh, uh, decomposed uh, that node um, and I basically reused it. So those terms that you saw like particulate anal uh, uh, analysis um, came from that document. And it's much better to adopt vocabularies that are pre-constructed and, um, and already use the term, and use the terms that are already used in the business. Uh, you can always add more detail to a taxonomy. So a taxonomy is a really good place to start. I, I, get, I, I recommend actually getting uh, content out to users quickly um, and then iterate from there and add value to a taxonomy as users get used to using um, the data and, um, and then you can add more semantic value if that's required. I think that's a, a good uh, a summary of why to use a taxonomy rather than a thesaurus or ontology. Okay, thank you. Um, here's an interesting one. Could you describe how metadata encourages exploration of content? Uh, sure. I, I think I, I mentioned it earlier, but uh, users actually uh, uh, you, use metadata to, uh, to, to find, you know, as we do, to find uh, results. And um, people in the process of searching will test many combinations of terms. Uh, and you can learn a lot by searching an example and examining the results. Uh, I find that I find more precise terms as I read the result sets and maybe go to some documents. It helps me navigate through a subject and, uh, and read content and adjust my uh, search strategy. Uh, you can, um, uh, typically we may show the, the search terms to, uh, to users in facets. So if you expose a, a, a term in a, facets, a faceted search, um, you can show a range of variables and let users adjust their query to get uh, uh, the, the right result. So that's exploring uh, the data and learning something more about it. Uh, there are several other best practices, I think. Um, you can show the search terms that yielded a specific result in the in the result set, and I've I've seen that I've seen Google using that lately. So it will tell the the terms that actually use uh, that result, and um, in some cases you can actually expose and show uh, the the taxon taxonomic tree. You can so you can browse through uh, the taxonomy and select the best terms to to uh, use to get the results that you need. Um, I try to give people the advantage of the work uh, done on the taxonomy so that they can uh, learn and discover while they're in the, in the environment that I built. I think that's it. Okay, that's an interesting question. We had some of those experiences when I was at NTT. It was really interesting to discover new things when you started looking at your content and looking at the connections between them. Uh, so some of the saying, I can imagine that adding terms, concepts, and definitions would add a lot, excuse me, 
pardon me, um, add a lot more work to the process of applying metadata to content. Um, my people already resist adding metadata to their content. Can you use a thesaurus or an ontology to auto-categorize content? So I guess the heart of that is how much of this can you automate? Yeah, um, I, I find there are frequently objections to applying metadata when you talk to users. Uh, so you really have to work hard to find sources of metadata that don't require people to do much work. And so adding on new work is difficult to do. Um, there are four ways that I've found that you can gather and apply metadata. Uh, some of them involve people, but you really want to try to be extremely efficient in the use of the company's scarce resources. So you don't want to go back to people that often. Um, uh, I find if you ask people about the metadata that describes their work early in a project, uh, when they have the time and inclination to talk about the, their work, um, you can get a very rich description of the content, and um, and and you can gather metadata before the even the work starts. You can describe the project. You will know who uh, the the project team. Uh, all those kinds of things are are well known in advance. Um, also, you can use uh, enterprise systems like uh, the HR systems and the inter enterprise res resource planning systems to uh, query uh, those systems about the team members, uh, project descriptions, project size. A lot of data can be learned from enterprise systems. And um, you know, a lot of data is captured about, uh, about uh, the way the business operates in enterprise systems. So, um, it's our task to figure out where that data is located and how to reuse it. Um, you can auto, of course, you can auto-categorize content and automate the process of applying metadata uh, using tools like uh, Smart Logic. Once you have an ontology or a taxonomy, you can write classification rules and run data through a classification server to extract and apply the, the right metadata to content. Uh, when you add new data, from the same project, the, a best practice is really that it should inherit the data uh, uh, from from previous uh, uh, documents so that you've uh, already classified. Um, so you don't want to go back and redo the classification work. So all all of those are strategies that uh, allow you to auto to categorize the content without um, actually uh, involving people um, in, in the work. Uh, these techniques are not intrusive. And um, I think uh, if there's a real requirement to go back and ask users to get involved in the process, you can uh, be very targeted in the questions so, um, that you ask, and so that you can do it in a way that's um, not intrusive in their work and gather the right data um, and the right terms by talking to people. Uh, but, but I would say do all the work in advance um, using enterprise systems and auto categorization um, uh, to, to, uh, to gather that data really quickly from uh, your, the systems that you have access to. Excellent. Uh, we have gone a little bit over time, so I think we're going to wrap up. Again, if we didn't get to your questions, we will uh, follow up with you, see if we can answer those questions for you over email or have a conversation where you could ask even more. Ralph, I want to thank you. It was a great presentation with really good information, and it's it's. Thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your experience with us and with all of our listeners. You sure. all should ex great. Y'all should expect a follow-up email from us with a link to the recording of the webinar if you'd like to listen to it again. And uh, I think Ralph, uh, we might be able to share your slides. You is that a good idea yeah. or a bad idea? Yeah. yeah. No, I think they, I would encourage that. Right. So if you'd like a copy of the slides, please let us know. And we look forward to hearing to y from y'all in the future. Bye, everyone.